see too many. There's the hand sanitizer there. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so very much to be here as support for each other at this most difficult time. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Jennifer Buckby, who is our wonderful organist today, and she's also our COVID warden, and so we just need to have some procedures uh, or some comments on procedures. But you've done beautifully, may I say, in terms of social distancing and the mask. Jenny? Well, welcome to St. Peter's uh, Church community today. And this is a place that Ian knew well. And he and Faye often came uh, to be here and to worship. And uh, it is just, um, I guess, so appropriate of his children, Linda, Pamela, and David, and their families, I welcome you to this tribute to the life of our dear father, father-in-law, grandfather, great-grandfather, and our friend, Ian Leslie Bruce. My name is Sharon Haston. I'm a priest here, and it's my great privilege to preside. Now, our service will conclude here at the church and as I said, a church community that played a significant role in Ian's life. However, Ian's family invite you to join them after the service to share some refreshments and some memories at the West End Hotel from one o'clock onwards. Before our service really gets going, uh, it's a special request by Ian that a sprig of golden wattle, our national symbol, be placed by his great-grandchildren, assisted by grandchildren, and uh, what a wonderful uh, extended family, to place some wattle with Ian at this time. So I'd invite Lillian, James, Matilda, and Harriet to come forward to place this beautiful flower on their grandfather and great-grandfather.
thank you for a, a beautiful tribute to a wonderful man in your life. The famous English novelist D.H. Lawrence, who visited Australia and wrote a book called Kangaroo, he once wrote about the wattle, I think in a, a, a rather interesting fashion. He said, in spring, the most delicate, feathery, yellow of plumes, trees and bushes of wattle, as if angels had flown right down out of the softest gold regions of heaven to settle here in the Australian bush and with Ian today as we celebrate your life as the angels come down from heaven to take you home. We have come together to thank God for the life of Ian, to mourn and to honour him and to lay him to peaceful rest and to support one another through our grief. In faith and hope, we turn to God, who created and sustains us all. For as the psalm tells us, God is our refuge. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. So friends, we ask for God's presence here today, and we know God is here, and also God's support at this time. Loving God, you alone are the source of life. May your life-giving spirit flow through us all and fill us with compassion one for another. In our sorrow over Ian's passing, give us the, the calm of your peace and kindle our hope and let our grief give way to joy in the wonderful memories and the presence of Ian in our hearts, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we know, Ian's foundation was in faith, so we are going to begin our tribute to him by singing together one of his very favourite hymns, Amazing Grace, and it's going to be played for us this morning by Miss Jennifer Buckby. I now invite Ian's daughter, Linda, Linda to share with us a reflection on her father's life. Sharon, am I able to take my mask off?
Good morning. I'm honoured to be delivering Dad's eulogy. Uh, the word eulogy is Latin from the Greek, meaning good words or praise. But I don't want this to be a eulogy where the person is just so wonderful that you don't recognise them. So I'm, I do hope that those of you who knew Dad well um, will recognise him. Those of us who knew Ian Bruce well will appreciate his love of literature and of language and his desire to see it well acquitted. Indeed, he is passing to the afterlife accompanied by his favourite dictionary, Look Out Heaven. Ian Leslie Bruce was born at the height of the Great Depression in Townsville on the 26th of February 1930. He was the fourth child and third son of Leslie William Bruce and Mary Matilda Rose Winning. Ian's four siblings all predeceased him, Thomas, Robert, Janice and Leslie. Dad was very proud of his Scottish heritage and is wearing a tie made from the Bruce tartan. Dad's father was a railway fireman and later an engine driver for Queensland Railways. Dad's mother was the eldest of 12 winnings, six boys and six girls. Townsville was much smaller then and Dad's extended family was all clustered on the south side. Dad went to primary school at Railway Estate and South Townsville State Schools. He must have shown some academic potential uh, because he attended uh, Townsville Grammar School at a time when formal education finished at the end of primary school. In 1942, at the age of 12, Dad was living in a high-set Queenslander with Bombay shutters, the timber shutters around the verandas. He and his sisters had been evacuated to, to Toowoomba for six months as Northern Australia was under real threat of Japanese invasion. They returned north just in time to experience the Japanese bombing raids on Townsville in the winter of 1942. Brother Bob was still at home, but soon to be sent to New Guinea with the army. As an engine driver of steam trains, regarded as a skilled occupation, Dad's father was regarded as working in an essential service, was not allowed to enlist, but was often away from home. As those who have heard the stories know, there were three bombing raids on Townsville in 1942. The targets were vital military infrastructure. Garbutt Aerodrome, the harbour and the railways. The Great Northern Railway Line ran down the middle of Railway Avenue, crossing Ross River where it does now. Rooney's Road Bridge came later. Dad slept on the veranda on the corner of 9th Avenue and Brook Street, one short block back from the railway line. Railways were essential to the movement of troops, equipment and supplies north. I was fortunate enough to interview Dad about the raid where the bomb landed only a few hundred metres from where he slept. I'm happy to share both the transcript and the audio file, but this short excerpt illustrates the sense of fear mixed with interest and excitement that engulfed a boy of 12. I will not do Dad's sound effects. While we didn't know, the American overall command of the Townsville area had sent out three Aero Cobra fighters. Next minute we hear, makes the noise of the fighter planes and their guns attacking the Japanese bombers, you could see the tracers flying across the sky towards this Japanese plane, you see, and you hear, he makes some more sound effects, see the Japanese tracers flying from the Japanese back, see? We're standing goggle-eyed at this, and Mum goes, demonstrates his mother, pushing him down into the air raid shelter. Get in the air raid shelter. He got emotional, then recovered to laugh. Yeah, we'd rather have stood outside. However, um, we can hear the plane. We can hear them bombing over. Darkie said, that's the harbour. Then we heard this funny scratching sound. The only thing I can liken it to is someone tearing a bit of paper a long way away. And Darkie said, that's a bomb, pegs in. So we, we might have already had the cotton wool in our ears. We stuck the wooden dolly pegs in our mouths. This got louder and louder and louder and it had a whirring sound. And it went over our heads so close and then just a second later, a loud triple explosion, bang, bang, bang. 
Mum said as the bomb's coming down, away from the walls, because the concussion might injure your back if it lands close. So we're away from the walls. I tell you, I looked up. You couldn't see, it was so dark. And I looked up and I thought, am I going to die? He didn't die, but lived for almost another 80 years. Following his secondary education, Dad was signed up as an apprentice with the railways as a coach painter. Timber coaches with their beautiful glossy paint jobs and gilt lettering were still pulled behind steam trains for another two decades at least. Dad's artistic side was evident in his ability to work with gilt in painting the carriage numbers and as a community service in painting honour boards. Dad appreciated classical music, ballet and opera. And as a young man, he acted in a local amateur theatre company um, aligned with the Anglican Church, the St James Players. In 1952, Dad married Barbara Olive Williams, a nurse um, in, on a holiday after graduating uh, from the Wimmera. By the end of the 1950s, Dad was father to three children, Linda, Pamela and David, and was paying off a new house in Garbutt. When working as a painter on a foreigner, a weekend job painting a house, a timber plank gave way and dropped Dad from a second story height, smashing an ankle, not doing his back much good either. He wore built up shoes for many years to ease the pain. When Dad looked for another career, public health interested him. I'm old enough to remember fool's cap envelopes of Gestetnet correspondence papers turning up in the mail. When I think back, this demonstrated a huge commitment to further education. And Dad was so proud of the achievements of his children and grandchildren. Dad graduated in the early 60s and got a job as a health inspector in Innisfail in a state-funded program to eradicate Cane's, cane cutter's disease, or wheels disease, a severe form of leptospirosis. Transmission by bush rats was well known and it was one of the reasons sugarcane was burnt before harvesting. Dad's job as a brand new health inspector was to inspect the living quarters or barracks provided on farm to itinerant cane cutters. This did not go down well with some cane farmers. One nasty incident when Dad was bailed up by a cranky farmer with a shotgun saw him apply for another job. Despite this, our Sicilian, Calabrian and Basque neighbours in East Innisfail had made us welcome, expanding Dad's choice of menus, for which we are all grateful. As a health inspector, later health surveyor, at Townsville City Council, Dad respected his two bosses, Dick Elliott and Peter Foxwell, and learnt much from them. One of his roles at the time was to inspect the kitchens of Townsville's small but busy restaurant trade. I clearly remember surreptitiously relocating a green caterpillar from a leafy green salad to a potted palm at a popular seafood restaurant before him, a role he took very seriously. Dad had many interests. When we came back to Townsville from Innisfail, Dad indulged in pursuits that, in retrospect, must have taken a huge slice out of the family budget. Motorbikes, flying, range shooting, CMF, later Army Reserve, probably the cheapest of all, bird watching and sketching. During the war, Dad was introduced to motorcycles. My brother David knows more of the technical details than I do. But as a four-year-old, I vaguely remember Dad taking possession of a motorbike and sidecar when we were living in 13th Avenue Railway Estate. Although an experienced rider by then, Dad was not used to sidecars. The story goes that he collected the new family transport and careered into either a fence or a lamppost, unaware of the tendency of sidecars to travel in an arc. This bike and sidecar was our family transport for many years. I clearly remember a weekend outing to the Burdekin after 1959. Dad rode the motorbike, a Triumph? A triumph, David, a Harley? Well, there you go. Mum sat in the sidecar with baby David on her lap. Pam and I knelt at her feet in the sandy gravel that collected there. 
I also remember Dad competing in Speedway on dirt tracks where specta spectators used the then broadsheet newspaper, the Townsville Daily Bulletin, to shield themselves from the wet mud and gravel flicked up. So much for health and safety. Dad learned to fly in a tiger moth with Jan Kingmar, a distinguished but daredevil pilot with Bush Pilots Airways. Where the Murray sports fields are now was an airstrip then, one of many left over from the Second World War. My brother David reminded me of an incident Dad had on landing the tiger moth there, a small crash. I remember the repairs being undertaken in a hangar at Garbutt, all timber and stretched calico or canvas painted, painted with dope to stiffen it, but not that kind of dope. Dad loved flying and only ceased doing so when I ride as cruel his eyesight. Despite his failing eyesight and back problems, Dad participated in range shooting, winning many trophies in the process, and some of his medals are on display on top of the casket. Pam, David and I remember travelling to Queen's Chutes around country North Queensland, where we stayed in country pubs while Dad lay on the mound in the blistering sun. Dad only stopped shooting relatively recently, and his interest in range shooting has been passed down to his son, David, and to his grandsons, Will and Paul. Dad's other great hobby was the CMF, in those days Citizens Military Forces, later the Armour Reserve, and Civil Defence, later State Emergency Service. As a health inspector, Dad was welcomed into the Ninth Field Ambulance as the man responsible for all health matters, especially on bivouacs. As the Lieutenant, later Captain, in charge of latrines, Dad's nickname was Blowfly Bruce. When Dad eventually retired from the Army Reserve, he was presented with a timber cabinet that held a clean night soil pan. As one of the city's health surveyors, Dad was involved in disaster planning. SES has changed its priority now. You look after yourself first. But in 1971, as tropical cyclone Althea approached, Dad went off to the local disaster management committee, leaving mum and us three kids to fend from ourselves. Despite some blood on the floor, we all survived, but this decision of Dad's did not go down well at the time. I don't recall when Dad took up sketching, but I do have in my possession sketches he made of historical sites across Queensland from the late 70s and early 80s. He was always self-deprecating, but his pen and ink works capture the historical essence of those places. There was never a time when Dad was not interested in nature, birds and native plants especially. He was never without his binoculars. These hobbies gave him an excuse to explore the region's history and wildlife, and his last road trip with Faye only took place late last year. By the mid-1970s, Dad's two daughters were married, but his own marriage was under pressure. After Mum left, Dad sank into despair and resigned from council. The family home was sold and Dad downsized to a smaller house. About this time, Dad reconnected to a widowed family friend, Faye and her family, still living around the corner in Garvard. Ted and Faye had been firm friends of both Mum and Dad, and their son, Kenneth, is Dad's godson. Dad and Faye renewed their friendship, regularly exploring parts of Queensland that many of us haven't even heard of. Recently, Faye and Kenneth cared for Dad as one of their own family, handling all medical emergencies with compassion. Ian Leslie Bruce was blessed with three children, Linda, Pamela and David, four grandchildren, Will, Meredith, Paul and Alexandra, and four great-grandchildren, Lillian, James, Matilda and Harriet, as well as his devoted friends. His grandchildren and great-grandchildren brought him a connection across the generations and great happiness to his life in latter years, as did his special friends. Ian Leslie Bruce passed away peacefully on the 13th of January 2022 within sight of his 92nd birthday and surrounded by his family and close friends. Rest in peace, Dad.
what an amazingly rich life. And uh, thank you, Linda, for that insightful reflection on your father's life. Could I say, I've just retired after 45 years of teaching history, that if I'd known about that, all the World War II stories, guess who would have been a guest speaker? You and your father. Fabulous and frightening, though, wasn't it? Um, Townsville during those times. And uh, thank you for your reference to the pan, the outside pan. We can, uh, certain um, aged, more aged people in our congregation here will remember the times of the Dunny. So let us now relax and enjoy highlights of Ian's life.
Sei lontana, sogno all'orizzonte, manca le parole. E io sì lo so che sei con me, con me. Tu mia luna, tu sei qui con me. Mio sole, tu sei qui con me, con me, con me, con me. Time to say. Go on. 
Well, that was a, a wonderful tribute to Ian's life and just shows you the mosaic of life that he had developed around him and the, the wonderful people too that he brought into his life. I'd also like to thank Cameron Laird and other members of Morley's Media for yet another fantastic job and certainly for the family for bringing all those photos together. So everyone, despite the sadness we feel today and the concerns that we may have about our future, our ever-present certainty is that our Lord Jesus Christ will be with us no matter what, no matter what we endure right through to eternal life. So I'd like to invite now Ian's granddaughter Meredith to join us, to lead us as we um, join her in praying the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So we have Will now, a grandson of Ian's, to break open the scripture for us today, which is very brief, but I think one of the, the best sentences in the Bible to tell us how we should be as a human being in terms of our lives and how we influence the world around us. Thank you, Sharon. Just a short reading from Micah 6, 8. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you, Will. It sums all of it up, really. You'll uh, um, hear some, uh, some repetition here with uh, Linda. Uh, but Ian, born 92 years ago, as we heard, lived through some of the major challenges of Australian history and change. Only four months before his birth on October the 24th, 1929, economic hell broke out in New York when the stock market fell. One should retitle that event in our history as the greatest depression. We hear of all kinds of uh, concerns about the future of our economy, but the greatest depression just threw this country into a whirl. It was just for so many people totally soul destroying. In fact, Ian was something of a sandwich generation because his birth was right in the middle of two explosive world wars. As we know, he was born a decade after World War I and he would have remembered lots of the men and some women who came back from that and 60,000 didn't. So you can imagine it was a sad Australia around the time that Ian was born. And then a decade after his birth, we didn't learn any lessons and World War II exploded. It was certainly not the easiest time in our history to be a teenager and a young adult. But not all was lost. There were many positive advancements to intrigue this growing young man. He would have watched television with amazement 
When it first drifted into our homes in North Queensland anyway, about 1962, and I would think there'd be many of you here that can remember sitting outside of Chandler's with our own chair watching black and white TV. It was just so exciting. And no doubt he was glued to it with the rest of us. And by that time, he had his children, and we were all excited to have about four hours of black and white TV every afternoon, and it all ended with God Save the Queen. And no doubt, I'm sure Linda, who's around my age, we're the same age, we couldn't forget that day in 1969 when Neil Armstrong first landed on the moon. I was in grade 11, and I can remember with 13 other kids in a Holden Ute going home to someone's place who had a television to watch it. It was so exciting. And apparently, this was interesting, by the 1960s, a family could expect to pay for a black and white TV about the equivalent of $6,000 today. And uh, usually it was totally black and white, and I can remember my parents, and I'm sure this was Ian and uh, your mum, uh, paying it off over four years, and it was a task. Ian would have also lived to see Australians of recent times enjoy relative peace, and I say relative because we have been involved in conflicts around the world, but not to the same extent as those dreadful two world wars. And so Ian uh, enjoyed that relative peace and the abundant prosperity and to see its younger, youngsters, so many here whom I, ha I can tell you now would have a mobile phone in their pocket and the wonders of techno wizardry, what huge change. And despite all these changes, and these exciting distractions. And I just thought I could uh, uh, picture that little Ian down in that bomb shelter. It was a great story, Linda. And despite all these changes, Ian's life was based on the simple but powerful ethics solidly reflected in that description that we heard from Will. Even though the Old Testament prophet, Micah, wrote this, in uh, uh, 1800 years ago, it's estimated, it still stands as sound advice for us all to guide our lives. We are all called to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Ian was a man of integrity, valuing what was just and right. And we heard that from Linda in terms of certainly not bypassing the regulations in the health department. He enjoyed and he cared for his family and his friends around him. And he had a deep faith, which was his foundation within his family and significantly within, within our own church community here and in Garbutt. These were some of his many gifts that stood him well through the challenges of life that life had thrown at him. So Ian, mate, you leave us a legacy, a legacy to your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Uh, great it's a legacy that we all need to make this a better place as we journey through life. And that is what God expects of each one of us, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. And mate, I am sure that you leave us with no regrets in many ways. Amen. I'd now like to offer some prayers on behalf of the family and of all of us. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray with confidence to God, our Creator, who raised Jesus from the dead for the salvation of us all. Thanks be to God for the gift of life. 
and we today thank you for the gift of life that Ian shared and enjoyed with us. You have made us in your own image and called us to reflect your truth and light. And we thank you for Ian's life. We give thanks for the loving impact that he has had on all of our lives, offering us and so many others in our community so much as he did. We also give thanks for the example of Ian's life to us in terms of the time and the effort that he gave to each one of us here today. God of all mercy, giver of all comfort, look graciously, we pray, on those beautiful people that mourn, especially Linda and Pamela and David, their families and friends, and Ian's close friend, Faye Bowen and Penna, her family. Casting all your cares on God, may you know the consolation of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, each one of us, also give thanks to those, Lord, who have meant so much to Ian and have shared his interests throughout his long life. And we thank you too, particularly in recent times, for those who've been so kind in his comfort and care especially Faye and Kenneth Bowen, and the wonderful people at Anglicare. Above all, we thank you for your gracious promise to all servants, living and departed, that we shall all be made one again in you. Amen. So I'd like to invite another of uh, Ian's grandsons, Paul. Paul, would you come up and lead us? as we all together say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Paul, that was wonderful. There's not too many people of your age that know the Lord's Prayer off by heart. Thank you so much. Another favourite hymn for Ian was Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. So I'd invite you now to join us in singing it together.
Another element in Ian's life was his membership of the Army Reserve, the CMF. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Leon Jeffrey, who will join us to make a tribute to that part of Ian's life. Good morning, my name is Leon Jeffrey and I'm the chaplain for the Townsville RSL sub-range and it is always indeed an honour and a privilege to be invited to conduct the RSL poppy service. Now, on behalf of both the Townsville RSL and the Queensland RSL, I wish to convey their condolences to the family on their loss of Ian. Now the Poppy Service is a service in which we commemorate that a departed comrade has made the commitment of his life in the sacrifice of service to our nation, Australia, and we honour and commemorate that commitment. It also ensures that a departed comrade never commences on their last journey alone. Now, the puppy service normally has the service record of the departed. It was applied for to National Archives and I would normally read it, but uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't turned up and if we can get it at a later date, we'll present it to the family. The hour has come to rest. This poppy, the Flanders poppy, is an emblem of sacrifice. It is a symbol of a life given in the service of one's nation, and it is a link that binds those of us who remain to the departed, and I will place it in memory of Ian. I'd now ask my fellow servicemen to come forward and place a poppy. And I'd now invite the family and the extended family to come forward and place a poppy.
We now invite you to stand, but only if you are able for the sounding of the last post, which marks the end of labour and the close of the day. This will be followed by a period of silence in meditation of our departed comrade, after which we will hear the recitation of the ode. We will then hear the sounding of the valley, which marks the dawn as we rise to a new day. They went to battle with songs in their heart. They were young, straight of limb, true of eyes, steady and aglow. They were valiant to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor for years condemn at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them lest we forget Please be seated. Ian's body will be buried in peace. His name will live forevermore. Thank you, Leon. That was uh, a wonderful part of our ceremony today. Thank you very much. So now we come to our, the final phase of our ceremony here. On behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ and of all, us all, I'm now going to bless this water. Now water represents life the rich life that Ian has shared with us here and into eternal life that he now shares with God. So we bless this water in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
loving God with this water and this beautiful sprig of wattle, on behalf of us all, I will bless this man as he continues his journey to God. Jesus, we just bless this beautiful man. We thank you for his presence in our lives and his entry into your loving embrace. Amen. Friends, we now come to what we call the committal. Before I conclude um, with uh, the committal with our service, I would now invite our Paul bearers, uh, David, Will, Paul and Bill, and perhaps other members of Ian's family to come forward to stand around Ian at this time. I'd invite the rest of us uh, to soon, if you are able, to stand and uh, we will bid our farewell to Ian. I'd invite you to do one of two things if uh, you feel comfortable. To uh, raise a hand in Ian's direction or alternatively, you may like to place your hand over your heart as a symbol of this farewell. So we do this and we say, Almighty God, you have given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all who have departed in Christ. Ian. It is our prayer that you go gently with all our love and our gratitude into the heart of our generous God. We now commit the body of our dear Ian into your loving embrace. Amen. And friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. And friends, don't forget to meet together at one o'clock at the West End if you wish. So go in peace, dear friends. Let us go to follow Ian out to farewell him with a hearty wave. Thank you. <laughs>